Thanks, Mike, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me a chance to share with you some thoughts before the panel comes up. I'm here for two reasons. The first is because I heard about the event and that Michael was organizing it, and I thought I'd love to be part of that and share some thoughts. The second reason I'm going to conceal from you for a few more minutes, and then I will share it with you. Um, I want to say a few words about what I believe is one of the rarest uh, elements in human existence, and that is humility, because I think it ties directly to the importance of developing a culture in an institution where whistleblowers, people who have concerns of all kinds, feel free to raise their hands and to speak. The challenge of human existence is it's very, very hard for us to be wrong. I know this in a variety of ways. I know it from being married to an awesome person for 29 years <laughs> and discovering that as good-hearted as I am, I am frequently wrong, and it's a painful thing to be wrong. It's hard to be wrong. It's hard to stare at facts that are different than those I believe to be true and recognize that I'm in error. The human brain has evolved to embrace this difficulty with being wrong. One of the strongest forces in nature is the confirmation bias. That is, the evolved capability in our brain to suppress, to not consciously perceive facts that are inconsistent with that which we already believe. As a human being, which I am, and as a leader, which I am, this terrifies me. Because I have to begin and end each day with the recognition that I may not even perceive in my consciousness facts that are different from what I already believe that instead I will drink in, suck in facts that support my preconceptions and my biases. That terrifies me as a spouse, it terrifies me as a friend, it terrifies me as a leader. And then add to that the challenge of human existence, which is that I'm trapped in me. I can only perceive the world through an awkward six foot eight inch white, 55 year old male from the New York metropolitan area who has grown up a certain way, who has learned certain things, who has experienced certain things. The entire world comes at me through the filter that is me. And so you combine that, that really fundamental fact of our existence with the confirmation bias and the closely related challenge human beings have with being wrong, and you have a recipe for disaster if you're not careful. Inside the FBI, we are spending a lot of time talking about the importance of humility that is recognizing the things I just laid out for you, and the tendency of all of us to miss, in fact, not perceive things that are different from what we hold. And even when we're able to perceive something that's different from what we already believe, the struggle we have in being wrong, and the importance, if we're to be great leaders, great partners, and a great institution, to embrace the idea that humility is a goal we may never achieve, but it's one we have to think about every single day. When we talk about leadership in the FBI. We have explained to the organization, we're looking for leaders who are confident and humble. It seems like an odd combination. But the reason it's so important is the best leaders are people who are comfortable enough in their own skin to shut up and listen. That requires confidence because insecure people struggle to listen for reasons that make sense. Real listening is a confession of weakness. Real listening is me as the listener telegraphing to you with my shoulders and my facial expressions and maybe what I do with my hands and maybe sounds I make that I need to know what you know. Right? Every single gesture, every single posture I take that encourages you to speak to me is an admission that I need to know what you know. It's a confession of weakness. It's very, very dangerous and hard for people who don't have enough confidence to be humble. It's the second reason it matters a lot to us at the FBI. Insecure people struggle to develop their own folks. Insecure people can't be sitting over there watching one of their folks shine. Insecure people have to be here because sitting over there with one of their people here is a threat to them. And so we're talking an awful lot about the importance of finding confidence that breeds humility and an awareness that I may not know enough and I need to find out more things. So why am I telling you this in the context of Whistleblower Appreciation Day? And I know it was Saturday, but it was not a shopping day on Saturday, so we got you this today. Um, is that, as Michael said, at the heart of what whistleblowing is are people who see things they think are wrong and want to talk to somebody about it. They want to be heard 
and share a concern. Now, they may be wrong, they may be right, but they believe they've seen something that's important to an institution and they want someone to listen to them. If they face an organization that is led by people who struggle, as all humans do, and have not sufficiently made progress against the lack of humility in humanity, and they face an institution that is shaped by having leaders like that, they will not find people to listen to them. They will not be heard. So what should leaders do to try and develop a culture that helps resist that lack of humility in humanity? Two things. Talk about it constantly and then do things. First thing, talk about it. It's very, very important that we do things like the Inspector General's office is helping us do, and that is teach our people. Show them the importance of whistleblowing. Show them the regulations. Show them the laws, the rules that forbid retaliation. Show them all the structure that is designed to encourage people to raise their hand. That's very, very important. It's very, very important also that the leader, in this case the director of the FBI, speak to new employees, as I do, and say, let me tell you something about the FBI. You're not entitled to be right, right? I'm not entitled to be right. You're entitled to be heard. You're entitled to an adult conversation where when you have a question, you have a concern, you have a worry, an adult looks at you, listens to you, and then engages you. Now, you have to have your mind open to the fact you may be misperceiving, you may be seeing things without context. All that's fine. You're not entitled to be right. You're entitled to be heard. So it's very, very important that the director say that explicitly. But more than these explicit lessons, I actually think the second thing a leader has to do is actually the second secret reason I'm here today. The leader has to act in a certain way so that people see that and are shaped by it and copy it. I think about how you became who you are today. I'm sure you had your share of explicit lessons. I had an awesome dad who, thank goodness, is still around. He's 86. And my dad was a bit of a speech giver. And he always seemed to have his, his thoughts organized in bullet points. And he would frequently send them to me when I was in college on a little notepad that said, these are the four things you need to do to straighten yourself out. It'd be one, two, three, four. I love my dad uh, incredibly. I can't remember any of those bullet points. Um, I'm sure I was shaped by those. But more than that, I and you were shaped by not the explicit lessons, but watching. My favorite definition of culture is the way things are really done around here, no matter what they tell you in training. Right? I think that's how we became the adults we are today. People said certain things to us. They trained us in certain ways. But we also just watched. And my favorite example are things I can't even remember, but I'm sure happened to me. I'm sure there was a day in Yonkers, New York, when I was with my mom at a shop right. That's where she used to shop. And I'm sure there was a day she got too much change from the cashier. I don't remember this, but I'm sure that I saw it and I was shaped by it. I'm sure there was a day <clears throat> we lived in a neighborhood with houses very, very close together. And so it was easy for people to sell door to door, and especially in the late 60s. There'd be a lot of people come around selling stuff. I'm sure there was a day I stood behind my dad when he opened the door and somebody of a different race, a different background was at the door to sell us something. I don't remember it, but I'm sure I stood there whether I was four or eight and I saw whatever that encounter was, and I was shaped by it. And then thousands of those added up to me. Uh, my favorite example for my kids, which makes them groan, so please don't groan, is do you know, kids, that the same driving laws apply in Richmond, Virginia, and New York? The same laws. We've lived in both places as a family. To drive there, you would not know that. In, <laughs> in Richmond, Virginia, people sit at traffic lights. It's an awesome community. And when an old lady in front of you doesn't notice that the light turns green, you wait. You wait. There'll be another green light. She'll see a light eventually, and we'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> in the New York area, in contrast, uh, I had to instruct a too strong a word, urge my wife, who had never lived in New York before, when we first lived there, that if she's on the road in New York, and it's a multi-lane road, and she's in one lane and wants to move to the left lane, and there's a space between cars, do not use your signal because it's a sign of weakness. <laughs> People will notice that, and you're trying to take something from them, and that doesn't happen in New York, so they'll pull up. I actually urged her not even to turn her head to look at the mirror because they'll see that. Just with your eyes, look in the side view mirror, and then make your turn. So how is that possible? The same driving laws apply. Kids go through the same driver training. 
They have behind the wheel. They have in classroom. They get the same training, and the driving is totally different it's because of the way culture is. It's the way they really do things around here, no matter what they tell you in training. They went through that same driver education course. They took the same behind the wheel from well-meaning instructors who talked about the use of signals to change lanes and the use of honks only to avoid accidents, not as a punitive measure. <laughs> and instead of that training, they watched, and they saw brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and parents drive in a certain way. And without even knowing it, they became New York drivers or they became Richmond drivers. Very, very different. And so as a leader... You have to constantly worry about that, especially when it comes to the culture that we're touching on here today. And so it's important that you say the right things, that you and Michael Horowitz talk about things the right way, that you do videos together, you do training together. But more than that, it's important that you provide opportunities for people to watch and to see you. So that's the second reason I'm here today. I want my organization to know that I came because they will talk about that. And even without me having to explain the meaning of it, they will derive meaning from it. There was a fellow who just retired from the FBI named Michael Kobus, who 10 years ago worked in the New York field office of the FBI. And he noticed working there that his supervisor was giving people time off on their birthdays, but only people that the supervisor was close to. And that meant to cover their work, the FBI was paying overtime to other employees. And being a taxpayer and someone who cares about the taxpayer's money, that bugged him. And so he reported it. And the next thing that happened to Michael Kobus was he ended up on an empty floor at the FBI facility, the only human being among 130 desks sitting by himself for an extended period of time. And there were other things that were hap happened. But a message was sent to Michael Kobus. How dare you ask? How dare you Demand an answer. Now, maybe you're missing something, but how dare you insist upon that conversation? It took Michael Kobus many, many years to not only get his, his complaint sustained, but to get his retaliation complaint sustained and to get himself compensated. Why do I tell you this story? Shortly after I became director, I had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Kobus privately in my office because I wanted to hear his story so I could learn from it. But I also wanted people to know that I had invited Michael Kobus in for a private meeting with the director because it sends a message. At the end of the director's awards that we have every year at Constitution Hall, which is a huge day in the life of the FBI, we give out an award to recognize someone who has acted with integrity, who has seen something that doesn't seem right, and they've raised their hand and said something. And I give that one personally. And what I say, frankly, doesn't matter. But the fact that I stand there and it's the award I give out personally, and it's at the very end, and then I make a big show of going over and make sure I greet that person and their family incredibly warmly in front of an enormous portion of our workforce is about signaling. It's about shaping a culture. So the FBI is an imperfect organization because it's made up of imperfect human beings, one of whom is standing in front of you. We must understand that the path to getting better is humility. The model I use for my organization is LeBron James. And I'm not a front runner. I'm not saying this because the Cavs won the championship this year. I actually said this uh, when he was with the Miami Heat as well. LeBron James is my example for the FBI because LeBron James is the greatest basketball player on the earth today. And yet he believes he's not good enough, which is remarkable because he's better than all the others. But every offseason, he finds some part of his game. He watches film over and over again and then works on that part to make himself better. And so my message for the FBI is you are like LeBron James, or you ought to be. You are truly great. There really isn't anybody I believe compares to the FBI, but you are not good enough. You must constantly find ways to get better. You must adopt an attitude of humility, enough confidence to be humble, so that we create a culture in which people will embrace mistakes, will realize that when we do something wrong, it's okay. And actually, the director and the senior leadership will praise people who find mistakes and then fix them. And I'll give you one other example that was very important for our organization. We made a mistake in processing the gun background check of a guy named Dylan Roof, who then used that gun to slaughter innocent people at the AME Emanuel Church in Charleston just about a year ago. I thought it was very, very important that as a leader of the FBI, 
once we figured out we made a mistake, we just say so. We tell people we're sorry, we made a terrible mistake, we'll work to be better. That was important, obviously, because of the case itself and the pain involved in that case. But to me, it was also an important opportunity, to, again, to signal to our culture that it's okay to be wrong, right? Be sorry, be unbelievably heartbroken as we were in that case, but embrace being wrong and then find ways to get better. That is the path to greatness. You'll never actually get to true excellence, but you will get closer and closer with an attitude of humility. So that is the way I hope to by my explicit lessons and by the places I go and the things I say and the way I stand to embrace a culture where people will speak up and will be heard. Because by doing that, we will get even better. So I thank you for allowing me to share your thoughts and enjoy your day. Thank you.